Coming up, we have Mr. Joao Armando Gonzalez. He is a professor at Coimbra Engineering Academy, a polytechnic school in Portugal. Joao holds a PhD in urban planning and environment in which he researched on the possibilities to involve youth in city planning through active methods. João is passionate about education and has been active and involved in non-formal education for more than 30 years. João is also a scout leader at local, national and international levels. He has, at an international level, he's been a part of several groups and bodies, and particularly he was chairman of the World Scout Committee between the years of 2014 and 2017. So now, welcoming on stage, João and the panel. So, uh, good afternoon, all of you. Um, we came here a few days ago with the, uh, I think, the expectation of uh, learning a lot, um, exchanging, making new friends, getting inspiration, maybe to pick our brains, some of the ideas that we have got here. Have you been inspired so far? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, but the, the, the good news is that it's not only about exchanging, it's about doing things. I mean, it's no point in traveling from all around the world to Rio, even if it is a very nice place to be, um, without uh, having any follow-up afterwards. And uh, as Philippe was saying, this is pretty crucial that now we go home with some a bit more defined ideas of how to implement this. Uh, we have discussed very, very inspiring things here, um, but the work starts now. So uh, we heard the uh, reports from the declaration. I, on a personal note, if, uh, I would like to say that the team that worked on the, uh, on the declaration being a participative process I think deserves all our gratitude and respect because it's all normally a very painful <laughs> process. So, very well done to the team. Um, so, to uh, as I was saying, the uh, the work starts now. Um, and taking the declaration as the starting point, uh, we thought it would be interesting for us to reflect on what can be done on an individual basis, on our organizations, but also together, which is something that sometimes we forget to do. To help us to reflect on this and to uh, give us some inspiration as well on what we can take from here, uh, we have our uh, distinguished uh, friend here with me. So I would like to present the members of the panel. So sorry, sorry, Sara Nicholas, CEO of the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Tina Oshiva, wow, what good, <laughs> Vice President of the European Youth Forum and responsible for global youth affairs and UN relations. Aminula Antong from the Singapore Scout Association. Uh, Ag <laughs> it looks like a moderator that was here two days ago, right? Uh, Ahmed Alindawa, of course, Secretary General of the World Organization of Scout Movement. And Lane Robinson. Head of Social Policy Development, the Commonwealth Secretariat. So, thank you very much for joining us and to help us to reflect on the declaration. And that, my, my first question would be exactly looking at it, and you have the final version, you have you had a bit of time to go through it. Uh, some of you have. Um, so, we have this text. What for you does stand out as uh, one or two of the things that stand out for you as uh, the most exciting or most important for you in your uh, organization? Sarah, I hope you could start. I, I, I hope it won't come as a huge shock to anybody, given that I, I work for WAGS, that obviously the mention of girls and young women um, and their inclusion and equity is, is part of the declaration. 
Um, I think that non-formal education is essential to be able to empower all girls, and particularly in the world of growing inequality. I mean, we're in a situation where no country has yet reached full equality, so there is, is still a job to be done. Um, it's not enough to say that we're open to all, and I think all of us must go away from here and actively work to, be, to reach the young people that we're currently not reaching in, in those underrepresented communities, um, and, and make sure that we can offer safe spaces for them to develop the skills that they need to thrive in this ever-changing world. Okay, so gender is a big thing. Gender is oh, a big thing. Uh, the second one is that, that I really appreciate the focus that's given under the um, common objectives that is around the fundamental behaviors and values mm. that are needed so that it's not just around <coughs> developing skills, but it's around, again, enabling someone to develop the, uh, the behaviors that they need in order to be able to thrive. So a more solid foundation to develop those skills. Yes, so it's not about learning, but about practicing as well. Right, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Dina, do you want to share with us your uh, highlights from the text? I'm happy to do so, but I can also say that, um, I mean, even though I gave a couple of speeches, introductions to various levels in institutions, uh, but being here and speaking in front of all of you who are the ones making non-formal education a reality and you are really an expert in this field, uh, it's, yeah, it gives a bit of a pressure, I think, on all of us <laughs> uh, on this side, so bear with us. They are good people, <laughs> in general. Yeah, they showed that in the last couple of days. Uh, so I'll also start with something that won't come as a shock to you. Uh, so for the European Youth Forum, uh, the first and important aspect is the recognition and validation of non-formal education, which we also have reflected in the Rio Declaration. Here maybe it's also worth mentioning that when we promote or when we talk uh, about non-formal education, in particular to external world, it's important that we mention all uh, contributions that non-formal education uh, is giving. This is contribution to youth development, to active citizenship, to sustainable development. At the same time, it's also contributing to equipping young people with the skills that they need for future of work. It also complements formal education. But we shouldn't never ever mention only one of those aspects so that we don't risk uh, making non-formal education only for, I don't know, equipping young people for the uh, labor market, uh, with skills for labor market. Um, and when it comes to yeah, also complementarity with uh, formal education, we shouldn't also forget that yeah, the primary responsibility of the governments is to provide equal access to quality education. So although non-formal education is the one um, engaging and providing this non-formal education to disadvantaged groups, for example, and we are doing this and we are bringing the added value here, but we should in parallel also make sure that the governments are also doing uh, their work. Uh, then the second aspect is mainstreaming uh, rights-based and uh, sustainable development approach. Here I must be honest that I still need to go one more time through the Rio Declaration to really make the final assessment if this is mainstreamed through the Declaration uh, well enough, and mainstreaming it's on the content that we do, on the skills that we are building, on the impact that we are measuring, etc. And the final aspect um, is yeah, resources. None of these things happen without any resources. There is no magic without resources. And here I also mean um, resources for in-depth interviews, uh, for in-depth research, for in-depth uh, impact measurement, etc. So that we have the evidence that we need, first of all, to continue developing non-formal education, um, but also to... Um, sorry, I got distracted, but I think I was talking too, too fast and I got a signal from behind that I need to uh, slow yeah, down. Slow so down. getting evidence for our work, but also for the advocacy work that we are doing. Okay, so we have two different perspectives, which means that probably we have a rich declaration. Um, I mean, Ula, and can you share with us uh, your... Yeah, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. I'm still 18, right? But learning by doing, right? So. <laughs> 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 I 
Okay. So I think what I find the most uh, interesting is uh, the common objectives, the values that uh, are put there, autonomous, supportive, responsible, committed and inclusive. Uh, now that I look at them, actually these are values that aren't actually super new to uh, Singapore or even the Asia Pacific region. Because in our program, in the things that we uh, promote for our youth, the things that we ask them to do, uh, you know, in like our leadership courses, we uh, promote critical thinking, problem solving, mental agility, adaptability, curiosity, and imagination. Those things sort of come hand in hand with the with the with the common objectives in the Rio Declaration. So, I think yeah, that's quite interesting. Uh, so it goes in line with what you're doing also in yeah. Singapore as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, anything else? No. no. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's, good. That's, that's good. That's good. <laughs> Ahmad, from the uh, Wasm perspective, what do you feel as standing up? Yeah. Uh, uh, let me let me first thank the team who worked really in the in the declaration. I'd like to acknowledge. Also, uh, from our team, uh, Martin has done uh, wonderful work. I'm not sure where Martin, Martin Mayer, uh, somewhere here. And uh, all the team also with uh, our partners with uh, UNICEF and uh, UNFP, the Office of the Envoy and the uh, Big Six. I think what, what I find uh, in this declaration, uh, it's, it's concise towards the actions. I mean, puts five key themes or directions for actions. But the first one is very important to me because uh, Probably in my readings and engagement around informal education, this is the first time we take a very explicit stand that it's a right to non formal education. We always talk about right to education. This time we actually take that brave stand that non formal education is not an afterthought or not a luxurious thing to do, but rather is a right, it's a responsibility. And the moment we talk about rights, it takes us from basically if we can, we deliver to the responsibility, how we make sure that everyone live up to their responsibilities in delivering non-formal education for young people. That's a very important and brave stand, mm -hmm. in my view, that we are taking in this forum and talking about the right to non-formal education. That's one. Second, I think what was coming in this declaration, this stands, and also more from the discussions we have over the past <laughs> three days, is, is a nice mix where, where the words are coming from. We have experts and practitioners, but we have Probably I've never been to a declaration writing in process where there's this much coming from a grassroots. Mm. And by grassroots, we don't talk about consultation to grassroots. Here's the grassroots as well. Mm -hmm. People are working and leading their groups and leading activities at the ground. So that mix is allowing this, this declaration or this work or this stand, I think, to really be more authentic in, in representing the work around informal education. I think a third would be uh, at the beginning, we were talking about defining something by what is not. It's not formal. And that what is not formal can be anything. I think here we are drawing some parameters to explain what's in that scope, what are some of the common characteristics for defining that space. So it's not an like, unknown territory. It's not like something that we don't know what it is or how to capture it. It's actually well articulated with, with certain characteristics and also objectives uh, that should be, should be, and also adopting even a definition. And what's nice, I think, is not we didn't invent one. We actually recognize there are plenty of definitions out there, and we are actually opting for one that we think uh, would be closer to our work. I wouldn't repeat what other, other panelists say, but I think it's useful to really emphasize what we have in, in, the, in, this, in this platform and what we have at this World Non-Formal Education Forum was really an opportunity to kind of like uh, dig, uh, go beyond the scratching the surface of the topic, but to start opening a serious conversation around uh, the directions and the possibilities of non-formal education. So someone yesterday or one of these days was talking about that sometimes non-formal education is seen as second class uh, education and that you believe that the real declaration somehow contributes to give more you know importance more uh, body let's say to the to the uh, to our profile as education right i think couldn't be clearer here and uh, i'll take by raise of hands as well in the in this room i mean how many of you think that this is a right it's not a lecturing non-formal education i mean 
Uh, I think it's, it's, it really speaks to the fact many of us, mm -hmm. if it was only for the formal education system, we wouldn't really be where we are. It was really about the experiences that we gained from, from that extra, basically what used to be called extra curriculum, right? Yeah. It was extra curriculum. It means like you have to do the curriculum and any, all what we do is what just like the nice to do next to the curriculum. Mm -hmm. and I think we're establishing here in a narrative of balance, mm -hmm. balance between the formal and non-formal. One of the challenges that we were recently talked to about with, the, with the Craig and our colleagues in Korea, talking about how, how basically young people in, in some countries, they don't even have a space to do anything out of the classroom. Yeah. They have to go to a schooling all day and then after schooling to study the schooling thing. And basically the rate of suicide is, is really skyrocketing because young people cannot keep with the pressure there. And what we are saying there, balance is key, non-formal education mm -hmm. is key. Okay. Lane, from the Commonwealth point of view, what do you think are some of the high points of the declaration? No, thank you very much. And I also want to thank those who contributed to the development of the document. I think it's very important for us to discuss the vision and a conceptual clarity around what non-formal education is. And and I think we need to be very clear that education is what we are talking. And education has you know, different pathways towards getting the whole development of a, a, a person, the holistic development of a person. There are formal processes, there are informal processes, and there's non-formal processes. And I think through this meeting, we're giving priority to the non-formal bits, because a lot of emphasis has already been placed on the formal. So it is about the holistic development of a person. And perhaps the conversation is that education has not fully embraced what education really ought to be. So ministries of education, governments, have missed the, a full understanding of what education is. It is not passing subjects in school. Mm -hmm. It is the holistic development, the mental, the physical, the psychological, the spiritual development of a person. And I think in this meeting, we're trying now to say, no, we need to correct that myth that education is the formal. Education is the holistic development of an individual. So in this meeting, while we have sought to do that, we have given priority to what it non-formal is. But I will go further to say that in my space in the Commonwealth, our focus is on youth work as a dimension of the non-formal education. Mm. Because non-formal education is quite wide and broad, but my focus is on youth within that cohort. And so I, I, we have to be careful that I, we're not going you know, to say, of course, in this meeting, all non-formal education is important. But as it relates to youth, I'm trying to also get persons to recognize the importance and contribution of those who work with young people, mm -hmm. the youth work, as I call them. Mm -hmm. And that is a wide range of persons, from the scouts, girl guides, um, you know, those who, the coaches, you know, the youth workers in government systems. It's a wide cohort of persons who are working with and supporting young persons. I think we need to, therefore, probably go back and, and keep working on what does this clarity around non-formal bit means. That's number one, that vision, what it is. The second and I think more important one is the recognition for what is happening in this space where we work with young people. And I think the reality is very clear that there's not enough recognition for those who are working with young people. And I don't mean recognition in terms of pay or, you know, it's just acknowledgement that the people who are doing a fantastic job it's almost invisible in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't hear it being blasted about, or you know, you, you see some, you, you see it's probably only glimpses of it in some space like in sports. Mm -hmm. but, but the vast majority of people who come out of your hands, those who work with the, 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 in the scouts movement, yeah. the vast majority of those young people who excel and become great in the world, nobody ever knows mm -hmm. of the person who was with them when they were eight, nine, 10, mm -hmm. building that emotional intelligence building those skills. Nobody speaks about them. And I think that is the real sadness that we will have in the world. If you, you know, for us, it's fine. We will do it gladly from our hearts. Mm -hmm. But that nobody really realized that I was the one who made that man the man or woman he is. That's the real sadness from this meeting that pains my heart. So I think we must work harder to give that recognition. And I don't mean money. It's not a monetary thing. It's just the acknowledgement that, you know, there are fantastic people in this room doing a fantastic job, often for no pay at all. Mm -hmm. Just the joy of seeing a young person blossom to be someone great. So that's going to be the emphasis for me. Okay. How do we do more of that? Jan Sanguiros, thank you. This is really powerful. Yeah. Really powerful. 
So we, we had different approaches. As you probably have seen, we have uh, uh, members from global organizations, regional organizations, national organizations, an organization which uh, goes beyond the uh, borders of the countries. So of course the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the focus is different from different perspectives. Uh, my second question uh, related to the first one. Sometimes when we have declarations, uh, it, sometimes I, I have this feeling that it is used to ask for things. That means uh, people don't give us enough money, we are not recognized, this and that. My question, and sometimes I, I feel that we lack what are we going to do ourselves? So my next question would be exactly, even if it is very, it comes out of the oven now, the, the declaration, but uh, what do you think can be something concrete, some, something real that you can develop uh, after this, uh, this forum based on the declaration as a stepping stone? I think you're absolutely right. And we need to focus on what we are going to do, not just wait for somebody magically to, to fund everything. And, and I think my first point is actually not what we're going to do, but what is an endorsement of something that we've already committed to do. And that's as an organization. Um, we've recently redesigned the way that we work. And we've put the non-formal education approach actually at the heart of everything that we do. So it's now baked into our fundraising and our program delivery mm. and, and every way that we're working. And we're integrating it across the whole organization. So to be backed up by the, the declaration here is actually validation of a what decision you're doing. Yeah. we've just made mm. and we're just starting to put in place. Um, I think the second one would be the uh, taking up the right, uh, non-formal education as a right, mm. part of the right to education. And, and I think the WAG's commitment there will be to work with our member organizations. And, and that's why we, WAG's exist, is to support our member mm -hmm. organizations to, to be able to do this in their national context, to be able to have the dialogue with their ministries, with their lawmakers, so that they are able to demand that right that non-formal education is, is part of the, the general right to education. And I think that's absolutely key. So we make an undertaking to our IMOs to work with them on that. For those from WAGS, there is a commitment here. Yeah, so, uh, no, I, that's what we were asked to well do. Well done. <laughs> Accountability, yeah? Well done. And then the, the third one, and I think we will probably all pick up on this in different ways, is around gathering the evidence, mm. because that's a large part of, of the declaration. The, the evidence base for the recognition uh, and the validation of the learning from non-formal education. So the piece I'll pick up on is perhaps the one that, that my colleagues may not. And that's for us to capture the, the impact on the individual, that chain reaction that they go through as a consequence of being involved in this non-formal mm -hmm. education process that, that develops the agency of the individual mm -hmm. to be agile, reactive, responsive. So we don't know what the challenges are that they're going to face, so it's not necessarily about a specific skill set, but it's Step that resilient individual mm -hmm who's able to tackle whatever they're faced with. Mm -hmm. So trying to, and, and that's awfully difficult to quantify, but trying to find some way of demonstrating that so that when people talk about the outcomes of non-formal education, something they see show. that as part as yeah. well as whatever any equivalency is yep. in the formal education yep. setting. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Tina. <coughs> Yeah, a lot of work has already been done, so we are not coming from zero, but we are building up really on uh, what we've been doing in the past, and the same goes for the European Youth Forum. Uh, of course, non-formal education is really at the core of our work, um, and for that, we also develop already a couple of policy papers, toolkits, uh, guidebooks, etc., that are very useful tools that we are using, but we will keep on using also to contribute to the implementation of the uh, Rio Declaration. 
Um, and very recently, we also adopted a new strategic plan of the European Youth Forum that will guide our work for the next four years. And non-formal education, of course, is a big part of this uh, strategic plan. And we are going to uh, work a lot on one side on advocacy part. Um, on this, yeah, until now, I mean, we worked a lot on yeah, recognition and validation. And we came basically now to the stage that uh, in European countries, there is kind of general awareness on non-formal education. I mean, and then we had different frameworks, uh, recommendations from the Council of Europe, from the EU, uh, putting these recommendations on validation of non-formal education to the member states. But where we are stuck at the moment is on the implementation part. So, for example, member states of the European Union, they had a deadline by 2018 uh, to put in place uh, recognition frameworks for non-formal education. And yeah, we are at the end of 2019, and of course, this is not yet reality. So this is where we really need to push for our advocacy to make this change so that member states are starting to um, implement this. Then we also need to work a lot in providing space for our member organizations to have, first of all, opportunity to share all these experiences, how they do this, how they advocate for non-formal education among themselves. So have this capacity building uh, and creating synergies between our member organizations. And then you already mentioned at the national level. So this is a very important one because the youth policies and education policies, they're in the competence of the member states. So we need to go on a national level. And for that, we in the European Youth Forum, we primarily engage with the national youth councils because they are the ones then talking to their own governments. So we need to work with them, that they work also uh, with the governments. So national level is the important one. And then partnerships, creating new ones, but also working on the existing ones. And for us, here comes into play working with other regional youth platforms. We have the Caribbean Youth Council, we have the Pacific Youth Council, Latin American Youth Forum, etc. These are our allies also uh, in this regard. And um, another network that I'm going to mention is ICMIO, International Coordination Meeting of Youth Organizations, informal uh, network uh, working on a global level, which also uh, has this capacity to push together for the implementation of the Rio Declaration. Okay, so we'll come back to the partnerships a little bit uh, further yeah. down the line. Uh, but uh, you mentioned uh, the uh, national uh, level, and I think it's that's an important point. Oh, even global organizations, they don't exist per se. So they, have, they, they exist to serve the national organizations. I mean, Ula, from your perspective, um, is there anything in this declaration you think could be done to make it, uh, to make it more real in, in your country? Well, uh, in Singapore, uh, like I said earlier, the, the values aren't exactly new. This, this kind of like, uh, things aren't exactly new. Uh, some things that we have done to, to implement it into our program is we change the how of the program, not the what or the why, because those are kind of invariable at the moment, for Singapore at least. Mm -hmm. So uh, we split it up into three tiers, because um, for the Scouts in Singapore, they go in in a three year at a time. So Cub Scouts are in there for uh, 9, 10, and 11 years old, and Scouts are 13, 14, and 15 years old. So the first tier is just to have fun, uh, like participate in all the activities. If it's not fun, it's not scouting, right? Correct. Uh, that's sort of the hook, right, to, to get them into <laughs> scouting. The second tier is to start to take on ownership, uh, learn scouting skills. Uh, but of course, the skills aren't... We, we don't learn skills just for the skills. The skills are sort of uh, vehicles to uh, get the scouting values into them. Mm -hmm. And the third tier is where they, uh, oh, they, also in the second tier where they learn their skills, they can choose and whatever skills or programs they want based on their interests. Uh, actually, most of my friends, uh, most of the youth in Singapore go for uh, programs in the Better World Framework, which uh, are all in line with the SDGs and all that, so that's, that's quite good. Uh, okay, so the third tier is where all our scouts are given leadership opportunities. Uh, they go for leadership courses and all that. Uh, it's not because we expect every single youth in Singapore to be a leader, but it's to help them learn to sort of lead themselves. 
what do I mean by that is what I said earlier on as well, uh, all the critical thinking, the problem solving, uh, learning why we have to care about other people and, and the global problems and all that. So, yeah, basically, that's what Singapore does uh, so far on the national level, just to keep yeah. you up to date. So all the elements of the uh, non-formal education uh, used as an educational tool yeah. through the activities, as you said, which yeah. is a vehicle. Yeah. Sometimes people forget that. And yeah. They just think that activities are just for fun mm -hmm. and just to entertain, and it, there is a, a value behind those. Yeah. Thank you very much. Ahmad, uh, what w does Wozn may plan or may ambition to, uh, to uh, use this declaration on a concrete way? I think in a room like this, one has to... Uh, be careful. Uh, to, yeah, be careful. <laughs> so I can't commit easily here. So uh, 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 I think it's, uh, it's uh, well known that Walsam and the World Scout movement is committed to growth, is committed to reach out to more young people. And uh, for us, uh, non-form education is not the goal, it's the tool. We leverage that tool and that method so you'll be able to empower more young people. So by doing that, we're able actually uh, to commit our uh, movement-wide commitment for growth, to reach out more young people, leveraging the power of non-formal education, using that transformative power of non-formal education so we'll allow that right to non-formal education to reach more young people. So that, I think, is a well-known commitment that we was demonstrated almost on a daily basis in all corners. This whole country uh, and uh, the Scout of Brazil have been demonstrating that by reaching out to more young people and in new communities. I think what we are seeing here also in Singapore is another commitment that we keep pushing for at all levels in Walsham uh, is basically challenging ourselves to bring the best program. Yeah. It's about the program after all. It's about making sure that we have more adult leaders and volunteers who are able to deliver the program. And what, what, what just explained about the Scout in Singapore, that they thought for you to reach out to more, you need to look inside first and ensure that you have a good organization and you have a good program that is going to be attractive and that is going to speak to the interests of young people. It's beautiful what you just said from fir first year of exciting them, second year of equipping them, third year of taking them to more specialized tracks, basically, basically where they would be more passionate and contribute. And I think that kind of thinking of always re-examine how non-formal education can be delivered in ways that will, will speak to the interests and aspirations of young people. It's also part of the commitment of the SCAT movement is uh, what you see here again. I think uh, at the, in the movement we come at the word level, we do events and activities, we imagine and reimagine things and we examine things. And as we are trying to build these partnerships and invite so many partners to come in and be part of this debate, I am very sure that uh, many national scout organizations will do what they expect us to do by convening at the national level, by extending a helping hand to others, by encouraging discussions at the national level, and by ensuring that that, uh, that commitment for youth empowerment is shared with many actors and that we're open for learning uh, from each other. Uh, left to say, I think, in the, in the commitment to drive this forward, there is always a, an advocacy track for this work because we know that even if we continue doing what we need to do, we still need to convert others to understand the importance of this work. I think also in the advocacy track, we are very committed to work with others, with, the, uh, with colleagues here and uh, other international organizations to raise more awareness and drive more, more investments in, uh, in non-formal education for the entire youth organization sector, including the scout movement. And I think that commitment will, will find its way. So both by expanding, enhancing our program, reaching out to new communities, leading by examples, engaging our national scout organization, and certainly speaking up, speaking out, advocating, and putting the case for more investment in formal education. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ahmed. Mm -hmm. Lane, yes. uh, tell us. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, well. Um, let me thank you. The, the declaration is, is, is a wonderful tool for us to use in the Commonwealth to accelerate our advocacy on youth development and non-formal education. I mean, you know, our starting point has been that when we did an assessment of our countries, um, 53 countries, to see what was the state of non-formal education and youth development in the countries. Huh? And what we found was, you know, a sadness that says that there's not barely any recognition or no investment, uh, no support for the sector. 
and that the sector was very fragmented. You know, everybody is working on youth development, but there's no cohesion. You know, the, the government ministries who are responsible for youth are, didn't have the capacity to support institutions who are doing this work. It was a very sad revelation for us to see that. Mm -hmm. And so this declaration will help us to accelerate engagements with our governments to say this genuinely is a solution to the problems that we are facing on unemployment with youth. It genuinely is a solution when we talk about peace and conflict situations. That's what the, the, the missing peace report says. These are genuine solutions. Mm -hmm. And so when I see countries asking, what do I do next? When I go to see countries on the first, what am I going to do? The youth unemployment rate is so high. In the education system is trying, everybody is trying, but we are not making the grade. What do you do? And I say to them, genuinely, invest in youth work and non-formal education. It is a solution. And I think this will now say to us, the, the, youth, the youth work, the non-formal community is coming together because we believe we want to do something. And then we have to go a bit further. We need to embed the declaration and the, 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 the thoughts of the declaration into policies. How many youth policies speak about non-formal education? Our research tells us not enough, barely any reference youth work or so on. So we're talking about youth, but they're not talking about non So where are they going to get the knowledge and skills that we're talking about? Mm -hmm. So our youth policies and our youth regulations and legislations need to begin to reflect this issue. And then I go further. Uh, a, a third one is at the country level, the people working with youth need to come together. I think that's what Ahmed is mentioning. <laughs> at the country level, the advocacy among ourselves is very weak. Um, so we have been investing our resources to get people talking together at the national level. Scouts, girl guides, government officials, those who in civil society, come together because we need to raise the profile of what we're doing at the national level. And then finally, I think one last night, I think for us, we are committing to do, we will have to have a discussion with our national leaders, our prime ministers and presidents. Many of them, as I said, I mean, are past scouts, and yeah. so on, they have done it. So, so when you get to that high office, why do you turn your back? Yeah, you forget. Why do you forget <laughs> that you are where you are because of the non-formal education when you were young? I mean, this is just crazy. So, so we are committing to say, remember. We're going to say to our leaders in the upcoming meeting we have with our heads, please remember where you got mm -hmm. your knowledge and skills and what made you the person you are. Remember, and as you remember, call for investments, greater investments and support for the sector, because that is what the sector will need mm -hmm. so that we can accelerate 10 years. In January, it will be 10 years to 2030. Can you believe it already? Mm -hmm. A decade to solve these world problems. Mm -hmm. I think we're equal to it, though. Okay. I think we can do it, but we need <coughs> this groundswell from all of our actions, all of our act coming together, we can do it. And I believe you can tell the minister that more 400 people think the same, <laughs> same way. Yeah? Okay, um, before we go on, I know that there are a few um, people and organizations uh, which also would like to share some of their intentions or commitments uh, for the future. And I think UNICEF is one of them, correct? Do you want to share with us some of your uh, thoughts? Thank you very much. Um, shall I turn? Yeah, as you wish. Wow. <laughs> it is scary. <laughs> uh, so it's been very exciting spending three days here with you. Uh, I'm very satisfied of how this has been shaping up. Um, I think that the declaration is, is a little masterpiece, we can say. <laughs> <laughs> or at least this is what we thought when we were in the midst of it. Um, um, I, I am particularly satisfied of uh, the importance that is given in having a systematic approach in inscribing this in the, in the country policies. This is what we need to make a difference at scale to reach big numbers. Um, this is what added value that the UN can, can help with. Um, and definitely we're going to bring this back to New York. We're going to bring this back to the regional offices as the tool that we're going to use for uh, promoting our advocacy internal and with the, with the government. And then very, very happy to see here we are with the scouts, um, to see that it is also uh, uh, re, 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 recalled the importance of non-formal education for um, building a better society through young people who are civically engaged. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabio.
Okay, so as far as I know, UNFPA also would like to share some thoughts on the declaration. Other of our partners. Thank you. This is Jose Roberto Luna from UNFPA. I'm part of the Adolescents and Youth team. And we are not only happy, but delighted to be here with you sharing because we have been sharing with you, being part of your discussions, taking the opportunity to know and learn about your movement. And we know that we share our values and we share the values of human rights, gender equality. We believe together in a world that where young people can take power over their lives and also to transform their reality. As UNFPA and on behalf of UNFPA, we are with you. We believe that the non-formal education should be considered as a sector, as the declaration is stated and also related to the human right to education among other human rights. And because we are in Brazil, we are in Rio, the home of the popular education, we know that non-formal education is also crucial and is a pathway to transform the life of young people, transforming the different operations that they are facing in their lives. And throughout our global strategy, my body, my life, my work, we are committing today with you to continuing this partnership with the movement of the Scouts. And we believe that our partnership, and we believe in our partnership with other agencies as well, to continuing working together and building this movement and moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So before I open a little bit to the floor, I know the Duke of Edinburgh Award also would like to share some thoughts. <laughs> you can speak from there if you, if you prefer. Hi, uh, this is Melek from the Duke of Edinburgh's International Award Foundation. Um, as a provider of non-formal education and a member of the Big Six Alliance, uh, we are going to respond to the uh, actions uh, of the declaration to our best ability and capacity uh, and I would like to pick up on two uh, of the actions in the declaration uh, one of them is the right to education non-formal education and the partnerships which are closely interlinked mm -hmm. I think um, in order for us to be able to speak about uh, right to non-formal education it first needs to be accessible to all and at the moment there is an accessibility gap so not every young person is in a position to be able to access non-formal education. And I think as the big six organizations and the other providers of non-formal education, there's a key role for us to play, maybe to, when we're looking at our growth strategies, to look at our growth strategies in a way to first close that gap and close that gap with the most appropriate provider at the time, and then maybe help each other and promote each other to provide choice for young people. Mm -hmm. So first, access and then choice. Um, and and I, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to working with uh, all the other uh, providers um, on that. Thank, Thank you very you. much. <laughs> so we are joining forces more and more. OK, is there any other organization? I know this is a bit short, that the declaration is just out of the, um, out of the press now, but uh, if there is anyone which would like to, uh, yes, please. Microphone over there, please. Uh, good afternoon, uh, my name is Wan Jung Bian from UNESCO headquarters in Paris. And I'm very, uh, I would like to first start with uh, congratulating everybody in the room for this amazing declaration that recognizes the importance of non-formal education. And I'm also very much pleased to see that this new framework on education for sustainable development in the next 10 years, ESD for 2030, is recognized in this uh, declaration. So uh, I would like to invite all the organizers of this uh, forum to take the opportunity of this upcoming UNESCO World Conference uh, on ESD that is going to take place 2 to 4 June 2020 in Berlin to highlight this real declaration and showcase how non-formal education is contributing towards educating for the sustainable development goals. Thank you. Thank you very much.
And the next opportunity, Berlin, okay? We'll meet in Berlin. Uh, any other? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Ralph from Youth Peer Education Network. It's one of the largest youth-led and youth-serving organizations working for the advancement of young people in the field of sexual reproductive health and rights in more than 52 countries. We are pioneered by UNFPA uh, in 2002, and we continue to um, uphold this Rio Declaration in more than 52 countries, especially providing non-formal education during humanitarian crisis. At the same time in the Philippines and Asia Pacific, we will um, remind our government that before our colonizers came to our shore, non-formal education has been already embedded in our culture. And okay. non-formal education like teaching in, with the sheds of the trees, yeah. in our yeah. indigenous people. So non-formal education is embedded in our culture before the Western people came to our region. This Thank is you. really cool, isn't it? <laughs> That's interesting because sometimes we just think that we discover the uh, moon, right? And then uh, yeah. suddenly, no, it has been there forever. That's a, thank you very much. Really good. Uh, anyone else? Yes, Ireland. Uh, microphone, please. So, uh, firstly, I would just like to thank Martin, who just texted me there and reminded me that I was supposed to stand up. Uh, hello, my name is Callum Hederman, I'm from Scouting Ireland, and uh, it has been, uh, uh, I don't know how to word it, it has been a pleasure watching you work and working together to form this amazing declaration. Uh, one thing that has really shone true to me, which, um, which I was reading today in the activity points, is uh, from uh, point four, five, and six, which really ties in with a uh, recognition of non-formal education, as well as partnerships. So uh, one thing that has shown across, is, across the whole panel is that um, your, your willingness and your, acti your, your, your activeness towards working towards partnerships and a collaboration. And one thing that I feel very strongly about is partnerships. And that was one of the main things I've come here to, to do, is to form new partnerships and to network. So uh, I believe that this declaration is amazing. But if it, it will only work if we are all agents of change. We, are, we all have a, have, a, have a right and a role in each of our respective organizations to stand up and to advocate for what is right. So I believe that, um, that this is a very positive move forward, but that all, all of us here have a role, and I have no doubt that every single one of you have a very significant role in your respective organizations. So I would just like to give one, round, one big round of applause to the amazing planning team and the team that have put together the declaration and to everyone else. Thank you. Well, well, well just to mention that he's maybe the youngest participant. He's just 17 years old. And here's, here's, and, Yes, he's 18, 18 years old, and if you wonder, I think more than a declaration, we have a clear like manifestation of like what non-formal education does for for young people. So yeah. that's that's just a good reminder. Thank you very much. That's why we work for, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. If there is any, only one more person which would like to. Uh, um, share how this uh, declaration is inspiring for any specific actions or plans that they have? Anyone? Oh, there. Up there. Hi, uh, I'm Lily from Restless Development. Um, so we are an agency that supports um, young people to become leaders in their own community. And we use non-formal education um, as a tool um, to do this. We don't specialize in non-formal education, and it's, uh, it's something that instead we are utilizing. And so really what I'm saying is, uh, I kind of, for everybody here who's working um, in, in kind of development but not specializing in non-formal education, um, we need to be prioritizing this. Um, showcasing those who we're working with that this is really, it's more than a tool, 
um, to support young people. It's really an avenue for them to um, achieve their, their potential. So that's something that I'll be taking back mm -hmm. to my organization and putting it at the priority uh, moving forward. And I urge anybody who's not with the scouts, <laughs> um, but in a similar position to do the same. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. OK, let's go back to our panelists. That's why you're paying you for, right? You, you need to speak, say something. Um, no, it's a joke, man. It's a joke. It's a joke. Volunteers. Sorry. It's a joke. Um, OK, the, um, let, let's go back to collaboration and partnerships that we already, uh, you know, already mentioned before. Um, my question, one of the things that we have been reminded during these three days is that the, the providers of non-formal education are very, very diverse, from youth organizations to um, schools to, I mean, really, really different. So my, my, my question is, is it possible that with all this diversity, uh, is it, in, how can people collaborate? In which areas do you see some collaboration? Can you give us some examples uh, where we can also, a bit based on the declaration that we have uh, uh, presented, is there any areas that you see as, as common on different areas which could have some collaboration in? Uh, Tina, maybe I can start with you this time. Yeah, actually, I, yeah, I mentioned partnerships already in the previous round, and I did this intentionally, because <coughs> this is key partnerships. Um, I can go out and I can talk, talk, talk about non-formal education. Uh, it will get me a non-formal education a little bit further, but if I do it together with you, with you, with you, with you, with all our organizations, we will go way, way, way further. Mm -hmm. So that's why I already put it before, and that's something that we can actively contribute and use our already existing uh, networks. Uh, I mentioned before the national level, uh, so partnerships, collaboration on national level. Now I would like to build on interregional cooperation as well. So, uh, for example, we did a lot of work on Europe-Africa cooperation, on Europe-Latin America. So I would actually invite all of you not to forget about interregional cooperation as well. So not just on your national, on your regional level, not only on global, but really seeking these synergies between uh, different continents, between different regions. Uh, for but example... Can, yeah. can I interrupt you? It, but it is normally about I don't know, advocacy or about research on non-formal education or uh, recognition. Is there any specific areas in which you, you, you have some experience on? on, on all of this, oh, uh, okay. but I can and give more. you one example. Uh, Unfortunately, this initiative does not exist anymore, but I will explain this part. Um, so it's called African University on Youth and Development. You see, it's called university, but it's not formal education. It was one week of different uh, training courses for young people from all across Europe and Africa coming together on one place. Um, yeah, taking part in different uh, training courses in one week. This is... Uh, also a place where I personally explored another level of empowerment and power of the non-formal education. Mm -hmm. Because these spaces bring, uh, bring you out of your comfort zone, they bring you out of your bubble, out of your natural environment. So I came from uh, European context to this environment where I could, for the first time in my life, engage with young people from all across Africa. Mm -hmm. This diversity that was brought to these trainings is incredible. Mm -hmm. And what hurts me is that we don't have it anymore. And why we don't have it? Because African Union and European Union decided to invest resources somewhere else. But we are not giving up. We are still advocating and fighting. And next year, there is another Africa-Europe uh, summit coming up. We are keep on going, promoting these spaces because we truly believe them and in all the magic that they bring to young people. Um, we also used to have a Latin American University on youth and development. We are also fighting and advocating to bring these spaces together. So these are concrete examples of these interregional uh, cooperations. And this also then builds uh, your, up to your global cooperation, which we are uh, doing right now. 
Um, and here we first of all need to agree on what are we saying? So for example, on the advocacy part, and to whom do we want to talk to? Mm. And having this real declaration now is bringing us to this point that we know what are we talking about and to whom we want to talk mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are still some things that we need to clarify, but we have a very good starting base that we can work on on a global level. We also need to make sure that we bring different stakeholders into this story. So, okay, youth organizations, but also then talking to governments, uh, talking to other providers of non-formal education, uh, education, etc. And then if we talk more about the content and yet the context in which we need to, in my opinion, work on, it's actually the global mega trends. Mm -hmm. So if you look at yeah. what is happening around the world now, we identified in one of our reports four mega trends. So globalization, climate change, demographic change, and technological advancement. So these are the four global mega trends that I think we should all uh, be working Explore. together. Yeah, okay. uh, exactly. And I will also use this opportunity to actually say a big, big thank you to Vosum and all the partners organizing this forum, uh, because it's a beginning of a new partnerships. This forum already created so many new partnerships. Um, also, yeah, thank you for inviting non-scouts as well. We feel very thankful uh, to have this opportunity to, to be here. You opened up already for new partnerships, but also this forum is bringing uh, the global visibility that non-formal education deserves to have. So we have a very good momentum now. We made, I think, a great uh, boom on social media. It's all over the place. Keep up. We need to keep up all collectively okay. in partnerships on social media, back at home, writing projects on all fronts. We need to keep up uh, with that. Okay. Thank you, Tina. People like to think it looks like we're already going away. We're not going <laughs> away yet. There will be a tidal wave after this. Sara, can you share with us um, which areas you see as with the greatest potential uh, for collaboration? I think building on what Malek was saying, I think the meeting that we had of the big six which I think was probably only yesterday morning, but it feels like about a week ago. Um, this is something that we've all gone away from that, re-energized, recommitted uh, to that partnership and to seeing how we gain from all of our organizations working towards a common goal and, and not limiting that to the big six. But, but there is that drive now amongst us to, to take this forward. And I think that's around focusing on what we have in common instead of that, you know, and leaving behind that fear of the fact that we see ourselves as competitors. Yeah. And, and I think that's a really big piece for us. Let's focus on what we, what we have in common. And one of the things that we were talking about is yeah, and echoing what's been said absolutely about wasn't bringing us together in this space this time, but next time let's make it truly a partnership of all of us. If we think there's a need to convene again, that we all get behind it and that we all bring our commitment to making this kind of forum happen in the, the non-formal education space. Um, I think there's a, an area of collaboration which is a little bit more difficult, but we have heard quite a lot over the last three years. Uh, three years? Oh dear, it has three been days. a long time. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the last three days about the, the need to have those difficult conversations. And I think there's a partnership opportunity here in being the critical friend. And we can all play that role with each other so it's, it's also, there is that piece about working on the pieces we agree on, but also having those conversations about the difficult pieces. Mm -hmm. We can collaborate very much on the evidence base, and I think we all have slightly different slants on what we're looking at and what we're doing, and therefore if we can bring that together so that we have a really quantifiable evidence base that will support Go, uh, you know, our national uh, organizations to speak 
-hmm. to their governments, to the regional organisations. Let's pull that together and try and combine all of, of that so that we have a stronger piece. And I think the piece I'd like to finish on, and, and partly because I'm feeling very old sitting in this forum and, and on this stage, and when we were visualising what we would do in five years' time, I'll be retired, <laughs> um, is, is to collaborate and have a partnership on ensuring that it's the true youth voice that we are enabling to be heard and that that's what we're focused on and that we stay relevant and that we truly are representing what young people are wanting, Neat. not what we think or what only a small part of young people mm -hmm. think. So we've got to stay relevant in mm -hmm. that case. So, so those would be the areas okay. I would look at on collaboration. A good, a good group of areas. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, I mean, what, what do you say? Uh, at national level, do you see this corporate... One thing is this political cooperation and contacts and so on and so forth. Uh, if you think about Singapore and scouting a, a movement, a, a, a scout association in, in Singapore, do you see any potential for cooperation with um, other countries or other organizations also? Yeah, well, Singapore is uh, parked under the Ministry of Education in Singapore. That's just the way it is. So, uh, in a sense, uh, the Ministry of Education is kind of our biggest partner. But uh, that's just because uh, MOE, for short, Ministry of Education, MOE, uh, they've been wanting to implement a holistic approach into formal education. So uh, we're partnering with scouting and other uh, co-curricular activities. They're trying to uh, kind of make up for the lack of holistic approach in formal education. Because mm -hmm. uh, with a lack of something, partnerships have to be made to make up for like, lack of stuff, right? So, I think uh, with other, cooper other corporations and organizations, uh, what we learned about uh, building alliances and partnerships is that uh, we need a very good value proposition. Uh, what that means is it's, it's a two-way exchange. It's not just uh, I give you something and that's it. It's got to be an exchange, right? Yeah. So, Equal uh, partners. Yeah. Also... Uh, for scouting or Singapore scouting, like maybe uh, other organizations want a commitment from us, but uh, it, it might be a bit challenging because <laughs> commitment is not just making a promise. It's not just, okay, I commit to this. It's about sustainable action. So yeah. we need to continuously uh, commit, right? Continuously make the action. Uh, also, that means that we need a convincing narrative that we need to pitch at a correct angle. If not, we cannot, yeah, we cannot uh, make a deal or have the good proposition. So, of course, with that being said, if uh, we have a common goal with the organization or community, which I think most of us here do have, uh, SDGs and all that, then it would be a whole lot easier to, to work together. Work together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, yeah, some challenges for Singapore scouting is uh, the youth don't stay long enough and uh, like uh, they don't spend enough time in scouting. Like They only spend two hours a week and for three years at a time, right? So it's very little time. So commitments sometimes is a problem for them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think I'll end on a successful partnership story for a little more heartwarming feeling. <laughs> Uh, so in Singapore, we uh, did this program called uh, Integra an Integ Integrated Care Program. Uh, basically, we just partnered with schools, parents, and two other agencies in Singapore related to uh, childcare. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's based around young people who have been identified as youth at risk by the government. So the government thinks that uh, if these youths are not looked out for, are not taken care of, they will fall through the cracks of society. So these youths come from broken, broken homes, broken backgrounds, maybe uh, the family don't earn a lot, uh, poverty, or you know, just broken families. So there are actually three categories of these youth at risk, low, uh, low risk, medium risk, high risk. And scouts, of course, to no surprise, were given only the high risk mm -hmm. uh, youth. 
So, uh, basically what the program is, or what the program does, is just once a week, these kids will go in for a scout meeting for about uh, four or five hours, just, just having, doing scout, scouting. And uh, it's been going on for three years, and in the last two years, we've had a 100% success rate. What wow. this means is uh, we get back a testament from uh, the teachers, the principals, the schools, and even the parents of the children. And what they say is uh, after the whole program, the children who, when, when they came in, were completely rebellious, didn't want to follow any system, didn't want to uh, basically follow the rules. Yeah. Basically, juvenile delinquents yeah. uh, <laughs> made a 180 degree turn and started studying hard, started committing to stuff, you know, becoming a good citizen, basically. And I think if that's, that's just uh, partnerships in Singapore, imagine what we can do yeah. with partnerships worldwide. Like, regional and worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good point. Well done. <laughs> okay, Ahmad and Lane. Let, can we make it short? Because I'm having uh, signals. So, um, sure. one no, minute I, I, each. I think I'll just echo what uh, has been said and uh, what uh, Sarah said, that the commitment really to bring us together, uh, to bring the actors and the, and the field together. I think in this event, uh, we, we realized that uh, in, in scouting, we have, we have basically our convenings, our busy calendars, our events, our opportunities. Uh, to, to debate, but sometimes you reflect uh, that uh, there's this much you can speak about the same topic to the same people, basically, and that we need to open up that conversation. So we would open I think it's a sign also of confidence that we open up, mm. we engage with others, and we let that not only about uh, basically congratulating ourselves for the work done, but also looking at areas for areas for improvement. I mean, there are some of the questions that we received about the movement that reflects uh, reflects kind of uh, uh, what about the intergenerational element, what about youth empowerment, what about the uh, lots, lots of useful feedback that, that we need uh, ourselves. I think in the context of the big six, I think we are very committed to uh, further exploring uh, the future of, uh, of this collaboration. And I echo uh, Sarah in saying uh, for, for, for the future, we see uh, a momentum coming around this process more than uh, one driver for it, and uh, that, that, uh, that's certainly our intention. I would very much welcome that. Uh, left to say is a challenge to all my, uh, uh, my fellow here, uh, um, uh, saying when you go back, you try to do something similar. Try to do something similar. It doesn't have to be a big event. Could be just uh, calling for a small meeting for some of the organization around you. Having basically an opportunity where you can discuss with others, and you will be uh, surprised with the opportunities where you can really uh, building each other basically uh, advantages and competencies to deliver and support. Uh, I like what WWF earlier said, said we didn't want to create our own youth movement, we wanted to work with a youth movement mm -hmm. and trying to, to ensure that we are able to reach for more, uh, lots of these opportunities at the national level. So if there's one main takeaway, I promise you we will try to do our best at the uh, world de level. Please I promise that you, you will drive this also at the national level. That's where the magic happens. Now. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. You. Just, just, just in closing, and thank you so much again for this question, just a couple of examples of what is working. Um, in the Commonwealth space, we, we brought national per persons who are working in the national context together on youth work to form national associations. That's two years ago. We have 14 now across the Commonwealth and it's growing. So we brought persons who work with youth together to say, what can we do to strengthen and formal education? And we are seeing that grow. I just got an, a text from Nigeria. They just had their first meeting last week. So you see more and more persons are coming together around the youth agenda, civil society organizations working together. So that's an example of the national partnerships which we need to see more across the world. A second example is that those national associations, we then ask them to form, in our case, at a, at a global level. So we have a Commonwealth Association of Persons working with you. And they now have, are getting lots of interests outside of the Commonwealth, from Germany, Latin America. And that was two years ago we initiated that. And we're seeing people come together to say, no, we want to share common ideas. A third example, um, last year in Malta, Europe, Council of Europe and Commonwealth came together 
to have a conference to talk about non-formal education and youth work. And we were, fan we were amazed to see how in Europe they were learning examples from India and South Africa about how they do non-formal learning, how Ubuntu is what they practice, how youth work emerges out of that communal context of South Africa. And you had these light bulbs going off all over the world about how youth work um, and non-formal education can be strengthened going forward. A, a fourth example, very quickly, is, is that we brought youth workers and academics together to say, can we have them begin now to share, how do we change our education, mm -hmm. the education system now in academic, in academic spaces begin. And so we found, them, found a consortium of about 20 of the leading universities in the Commonwealth who are now offering professional development courses for, for in non-formal education for persons in their countries, in Uganda, in South Africa, all across in the University of the West Indies, South Pacific University, all offering courses now, short courses, to those who want to strengthen their skill sets. So we need to partner with the academic institutions. And the big one, the last one, is could we get partnership with our governments at a, at a stage and at a level where they will, again, recommit to this area? And so six months ago, you will not know this amazing story. You know, the question came from foreign ministers. What can we do? We will have a, we will have a heads of government meeting in Rwanda in June 2020. What can we do on the youth agenda? And I scratched my head and I said, I've listened to everything. We need us something on non-formal education. <laughs> I think that is the solution. I scratched and I said, could we perhaps have heads consider giving their full support? And would you know it? They, they accepted yes. it. So I said, wow, <laughs> what, what is happening? Then I said, but oh, I need partners. And I started, who could I call? And I called, we called Ahmed. Ahmed is saying, we're having a fantastic conference here. And I said, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and as I came, then I saw the big six meeting and I said, this is all just beautiful. You see, you know, when things are going to work out, 2030, you don't need to worry. Mm -hmm. Things will just fall into place. And so we have on the agenda in June in Rwanda, non-formal education supporting young people. And I've been fortunate to be here to talk to all the partners here and say, can we come together and say, we will work with governments to change how we are engaging with the 1.8 billion. It is a huge number. Together, even the big six is only reaching 250 million. Look how many more we need to reach. Yep. So we need a bigger movement of smaller organizations, the pathfinders, the VSOs, the organizations who are working at national level. We need a big movement on non formal that's the kind of, that's the big one. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hopeful, but remember, 2030. 2030, human development, human challenges, we have faced so many of them in the past. But I believe in the power of the human spirit to transcend every challenge. And I believe this one is the one that we have to take ownership of. Can the youth sector respond? I believe it can. I believe it can. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, we could stay here forever, right? <laughs> Chatting and stuff. I know you have other things to do. Um, just to wrap up um, this session, uh, I think this is a positive note in terms of the, how much we can achieve by working together. Uh, I think we all know that, but sometimes it's good to be reminded. And I think it, was, it is also important for us to remember that, that uh, uh, there are other people out there. I mean, not only these 70 organizations, these 400 people which are here, but uh, there are a lot of other organizations working on non-formal education uh, that probably we need to be a bit bearers of the message to them and try to uh, bring them to that movement, as, as, as we're saying. Um, so that's probably some, some of the homework that we have uh, once we leave uh, Rio. Um, as a final observation, I just would like maybe to sh say uh, that we don't do non-formal education just for the sake of doing it. Uh, we're doing it because we are transforming people or in we're transforming communities and by that we are uh, making the world better. So I think uh, all the people here, all the organ our organizations are ready to do that um, and I think all of us uh, mm -hmm. wish you um, a very fruitful follow-up of this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you.